Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word, which is the truth. We do receive it, written in our heart, written in our mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We've been sharing with you a lot of important messages. Most recently, we talked this last week on how we go on to perfection. God wants us to be perfect and go on to perfection in the Lord. We come to the place of walking in holiness and righteousness, being obedient, following Him, seeing this completed work in come forth in our life. Today we're going to talk about another aspect that's also important, and this is the conditions that are necessary for us to enter into eternal life. God wants every one of us to have eternal life. But it's not going to happen for everybody, unfortunately, unless they meet the conditions. We begin in Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. When it speaks of those that do his commandments, this is a present tense verb, first of all. It's not like it just did something once. No. Present tense means continuous, ongoing action. One who is continually doing his commandments. And we are under the New Testament, so we do the commandments of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that, when it says here about the right, this is really the word exousia, meaning the authority, and as Young brings it out, that the authority shall be theirs, is more literally what this means, unto the tree of life. Otherwise... If you are doing the commandments of the Lord, then the authority or the right to the tree of life will be yours because you've met the conditions. And also when it says they may enter in, this would of course would also be because they're doing the commandments of the Lord. This of course is a conditional statement as well, subjunctive mood, that they might enter in through the gates into the city. You and I are to come to the place of wanting to partake of the tree of life and when we do so, we will live forever. We want to, of course, be right with the Lord if we are going to live forever. And we must understand back what happened in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, when God made man, it says in verse 7, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here now, he was a living soul, spirit, soul, and body. He had formed his body from the dust of the ground. And he planted a garden eastward in Eden, put the man where, who he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, that's what he was supposed to partake of, to live forever. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of course, he told them that he was not to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If he would do that in the day that he would eat thereof, he would die. So the tree of life was available. Well, the fall of man occurred because man did partake, of, unfortunately, of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when we come down to Genesis chapter 3, in verse 22, the Lord God said, Behold, the man's become as one of us to know good and evil, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. That shows you if you take of the tree of life, you live forever in the state that you're in when you partake of it. If he would have partaken of it in the state he was in, in a fallen state of spiritual death, he would have lived forever in spiritual death. So we must be right in order to partake of the tree of life, which is in heaven, for us to be able to partake and live forever with the Lord. So the Lord sent him forth in the Garden of Eden till the ground from whence he was taken to till it. And he drove the man, out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep or to guard the way of the tree of life. So man would not partake of it in the state that he was in. The redemption had to be accomplished first so man would be right and then be able to partake of it we see there is a, a life that you and I are to partake of to live forever and we're to live forever with God but what else do we see about what eternal life is all about it is relationship with the Father and with Jesus Christ we see in John chapter 17 verse 3 
It makes a statement. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Life eternal is knowing God. It's knowing him because he is life. Knowing the Father, knowing Jesus, living with him, that is what produces eternal life. That is what you ought to be seeking after, to know God, to know his ways, to walk in fellowship with him, to be obedient to him, to know the Father and Jesus Christ. That is what he wants. Now, this doesn't automatically happen, of course, because you have to do what's necessary to see it happen. When it says might know, this is a present tense verb, as you see, which means continually we're to be knowing him, but also it's subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement. It's not automatic that it's going to happen. In other words, this is life eternal, that they may continually be knowing thee if the conditions are met, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You've got to meet the conditions in order to come to this place, and that would be the place of having eternal life. We see over in Psalms, chapter 36. In Psalms 36, we see in verse 9, where is this life coming from? It's coming from God. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. The fountain of life. There's a fountain of life that comes from the Lord. And it's to come into you and operate in you continually so that you will see the life of God be manifest in you. Of course, how did we come into relationship with the Lord? We come into relationship when we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Jesus is the one who has the life. In him was life. The life was the light of men. Jesus came. He brought the light. And when those who would receive the light would come into the life of Jesus Christ, having received him, get the spirit of Jesus Christ. The purpose of Jesus, of course, as we see, was shown forth in John chapter 3, verse 15. He said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, he didn't want anybody to perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, when we look at these, again, this doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic. Whosoever is believing in him might not perish. It's a subjunctive mood, meaning it's possible that you could perish, but you're going to have to meet the conditions to see that come to pass, which is to do the things that are necessary to have eternal life. And what will we be doing? We would be having eternal life. Again, this is subjunctive mood, that we may be having present tense, ongoing action, eternal life. So again, it's not automatic, is it? It is something that's conditional, and it is supposed to be operating in us continually. And of course, how did that, how's it come? Because God sent forth Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him, as it says, and this is present tense, continually be believing in Him, should not perish, again, we see a subjunctive mood, meaning a conditional statement that he might not perish, but might be having eternal, ever everlasting life. Again, same present subjunctive. So all these things are conditional. But the purpose of God is for us to ha be having eternal, everlasting life. And that comes from relationship with him. Now in John chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus begins to talk about this subject, about the bread of God. And he says, For the bread of God is he, it's a person, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life, the Zoe, eternal life, unto the world. It's available for the entire world. How's it come? Through Jesus Christ. And what do you do with the bread? You eat the bread. You take the bread, bread within you. He is the bread 
who has come down to give life unto the world. And he identifies that he is that. He says in verse 35, Jesus said to him, I am the bread of life. And he said, he that cometh to me, the one who is coming to him, shall never hunger. And he that is believing on me shall never thirst. These are present tense verbs, meaning ongoing, continuous action. The one who's coming to him continually and believing on him shall never thirst. That means we need to be coming to him. And what is he? He's the word. And we're going to be taking the word into us, the bread, eating the bread, taking the word into us. You need to get the word in you daily. You will never spiritually hunger or be thirsty because you're being fed the word of God, which will be what is going to satisfy and minister unto you. In verse 40, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son believeth on him, may have everlasting life. Again, the conditions have to be met again. Ongoing action may be having continually, if the conditions are met, remember, of everlasting life. And he says, I'll raise him up at the last day. Well, that speaks of the time of when there's going to be the, the resurrection. There's going to be raised up with the first resurrection. So he wants everyone to be having this, but again, you have to meet the conditions. We come down to verse 47. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto he that's believing on me has everlasting life. This means that you're going to be believing continually on him. And believing is going to be shown because you're doing the Word of God. If you believe what He says, you will be obedient to carry out the things that He says. You're going to be having everlasting life continually. God wants that. He wants you to be abiding in the everlasting life. We've already seen it's conditional statements. But this is the result of what will happen if you are continually believing in Him. We come down to verse 50. He said, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. So you're supposed to eat this bread with Jesus, the word. It's supposed to be taken into you. The word is what brings life to you. The word, you find it, it produces life, the life of God to be manifest in you. And here he says that you will not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... And again, this doesn't mean he's automatically doing it. If he might eat of this bread, you've got to be partaking of the Word of God because that's what's going to do a work in you to bring you to the place of being right with him, right holy with him, walking in his ways, and, of course, conquering sin and overcoming in all areas of your life. And then he goes on and says, The bread that I will give is my flesh, that's his person, which I will give for the life of the world. He gave himself in order to pay the price to accomplish the redemption. So, of course, that then we could come to the place of relationship with the Father through being born again. We come down to, of course, they said, how can this man give his flesh to eat? In verse 53, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat that you might eat, Again, subjunctive mood. The flesh of the Son of Man and might drink. Again, same thing. Subjunctive mood, his blood. You are having no life in you. Present tense. It means you're having no life into you. So if you're going to eat him, you're going to take him into you. And the way you take him into you when you receive Jesus and you get born again, you have him on the inside of you. And also the way that you're going to have this blood, taking this blood into you, drinking something, remember, brings it into you, is the blood is going to have to be working to apply to you to what? Brings you a cleansing so you are right with him. We know that this is also a conditional statement, as we've seen before in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, how the blood is applied to you in your life. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light. Again, present tense, ongoing, walking, 
subjunctive mood, if we may be continually walking in the light, we have to meet that condition. As he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, is cleansing us from all sin. It's working in us. So if you meet the conditions, then the blood of Jesus Christ will be working consistently in you. We go back to John, chapter 6. We come down to verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, this is not talking about literally eating his flesh and his, drinking his blood. We would know that because it would be contradictory to the Scriptures. In fact, if we even look back in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I'll even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and I'll cut him off from among his people. So you don't go eating blood whatsoever. In fact, even in Genesis, way back in chapter 9, verse 4, it says, For the flesh is the life thereof, and which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. And you're not going to eat the blood. So this is not talking about that. This is talking about taking him into us and seeing the application of the blood to bring us to the place of being righteous, to be cleansed, to be holy before the Lord. Back to John in chapter 6. We come down to verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat, man and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. This is the spiritual bread of the Word of God that's going to bring life to you forever. Verse 61, when Jesus knew it himself, the disciples murmured at it. He said, does this offend you? They did. They got offended over the thing, amazingly. He said, it's the spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and their life. They're spiritual revelation. It wasn't telling them natural things. It was telling them spiritual revelation. That you take Jesus within you, you take the Word of God in you that's going to bring life. You have the blood working in you to cleanse you from all sin so that then you then will have eternal life. And that is what He wants. God wants you to understand that without Jesus Christ, there's no way you're ever going to have eternal life. And without the blood of Jesus apply to cleanse you from all sin, you will not be righteous. And if you're not righteous, you are not going to be able to have eternal life. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's the work of the devil. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to bring his light. The devil comes to take, take away from you and stop you from having this. By the way, all these are subjunctive mood verbs. The theme of the cup cometh not for to steal. This is not an infinitive. It is a conditional statement that he, for, in order that he might steal. He can't do it automatically. He's got to have conditions met. And that he might kill. Same thing, subjunctive mood and that he might destroy. Again, subjunctive mood in every case. Meaning, he doesn't, he's not going to be able to do it unless the conditions are met. You giving place to him through sin or not using your authority to conquer and overcome him. And then when he says, I am come, that they might be having life. This again, present tense, meaning ongoing action is to be happening, but again, subjunctive mood in both these cases it's not guaranteed. It is conditional upon you meeting the conditions. This is your scene as we're showing you this is to emphasize to you conditions must be met if you are going to be able to enter into having eternal life and you are to have eternal life and possess it continually in your life. We see over in John chapter 11 verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. That would refer to the first resurrection, which is when we're going to get a glorified body. And the life. He that is believing in me, 
though he were dead, if he, though he might die, otherwise, the, what happens to all the people that die? Well, they're going to be coming back with him, and they are going to be getting the, seeing the resurrection, and they are going to come to the place of having a new glorified body, and they are going to be living in forever, of course, with the Lord as well. So this is that yet shall he live. This is talking about living and breathing. So this is talking about the fact you aren't going to stay in that dead state without a body. You're going to get a new body. You're going to get a glorified body. You're going to get a body that's going to be immortal, untouchable by death, praise God. Of course, how are we going to come to this place? It's through Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man is coming unto the Father but by me. He's the way. You've got to walk in his way. You've got to do things his way, not your way. Many people do things their own way, and they think that, well, I guess that was God working. No, if you're not doing things according to the word, it's not God working. You've got to do things his way. It's always going to be in line with the truth, the word. And also, the life will be produced as you walk in his ways. God's life will be manifest unto you. And, of course, you're going to come unto the Father through Jesus Christ being born again. When we see about Jesus, he's the one who showed us the way, as it speaks here in Acts 3, verse 15, when it says they killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. When it says the prince, it's interesting. This word refers to the one who is the leader or the predecessor in a matter, the pioneer, the one who had the lead to bring us into that. Because remember, man was in a spiritually dead state and somebody had to do something about it. It was God in Christ who came, who died, took upon himself the sins of mankind, was the first born from the dead, so that you and I could be born from the dead and come into relationship. He was the leader. He's the one who accomplished all this for us so you and I could come into that same place. Of course, what had to happen is we had to get the exchange where we get a brand new spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, if when we were, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God this is the word which means the change or the exchange that occurred. How did we get the exchange when we got born again? The old spirit is taken out, a new spirit comes in. The exchange occurs. We were, got the exchange, reconciled to God by the death through, this really means through, the word dia, through the death of his son, of what he accomplished, much more being reconciled now, the exchange occurring, we shall be saved. We will see the salvation of the Lord, which includes all the things that he wants to bring forth, <clears throat> his healing, his deliverance, making you well, making you safe, having a blessed life by his life. The life of God in you is going to produce the salvation of the Lord. It's going to produce the healing. It's going to produce and where is the life? The life's in the Word. So his life that comes to you through the Word that you're hearing and doing will produce the salvation of the Lord in your life. We see the statement made over in 1 John chapter 1. He said, That was from the beginning which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, have looked upon our hands, have handled of the Word of life. It tells you what, the, what produces the life. It's the Word. Jesus was the Word of life. The life was manifested, we've seen it, bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life was with the Father and was manifested unto us. How was it manifested? Through Jesus. How is it going to be manifested to you and me now? Through the Word of God. This is why the Word is of utmost importance in your life, to hear and to do the Word. So you see, that's the only way that God is going to perform things in your life, because He is a performer of His Word, and His Word is the life. So what are we going to have to do? Well, we have to make sure we meet the conditions as we've seen. There's conditions for it. That means we're going to have to make the right choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. You can choose the way that leads to life. 
but you can also choose the way that leads to death. Man had already chosen the way that leads to death by disobeying God. If you obey God, it'll lead to life. If you disobey God, it'll lead to death. Obedience is going to be the key because obedience produces righteousness that brings forth those fruits of righteousness unto holiness and the end everlasting life as we see in, Deut in, in Romans. So you need to choose the right way. Choosing life will be choosing the word, doing the things that God wants you to do. And also learning to do things his way, not your way. Psalms 16, verse 11. Thou wilt show me the path of life. It's a path. It's a way. You're going to walk it out step by step. It's not a leap or just a jump and here I am. It's a path. And you're going to be going step by step as you walk the way of the word. In thy presence is fullness of joy at the right hand of pleasures forevermore. That's where you're going to end up if you walk this path of life and you're obedient. You're going to be in the presence of God with a fullness of joy. And you're going to see the pleasures of God manifest in your life because you have chosen the path that leads to eternal life. That's why we've got to put the word first place and we cannot compromise it. People that compromise it don't realize they're choosing death when they don't do the word. They're choosing the way that leads to destruction. Psalms 30, verse 5. For the anger, his anger endureth for a minute in his favor, for a moment, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Notice, in his favor, his goodwill, his pleasure, looking upon us with favor is life. So you need to have favor. If you have favor with God, God will give you favor with man, and you have favor with him because you choose the way of the Lord. You choose to do what he wants you to do. You live unto him. You submit unto him. You're obedient to his word. You think in every situation, what does the Word say that I am supposed to do? I'm going to choose the way of the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 3, through hearing and doing the Word, and we've talked about this in the past, as you study the Word, you get knowledge, and then as you do the Word, you get spiritual understanding imparted to you, and then wisdom as you continue in it. Notice, Proverbs 3.18 speaks here about wisdom. That is the subject back here. He's speaking of the one who finds wisdom and gets the understanding through hearing and doing the word. It says, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. You are to get understanding, you are to get wisdom, and it's going to come through the word that you're hearing and doing in your life. You're going to be laying hold upon it as you choose the word and choose to do it consistently, and God will impart these things for you. And you also must retain it. Remember the devil tries to come to take the word out of your heart and get you off the path to get you to turn to the right or turn to the left or go any other way, which will hinder you, and you can lose anything you've gained, remember, if you don't continue to walk in it. Of course, it's coming to you through the word of God. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. Well, that should be where your focus is, what you're hearing, what you're, you're thinking upon, and you got what you got in, in your heart. They're life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Life to those that find them. That means you're going to be seeking for them. You're going to seek by seeking the Word of God to get the knowledge of the truth. It takes effort for you to seek after the things of God. That means you need to be studying the Word of God. You need to be spending time in the Word, in the Bible, praying, interceding, doing all the things, serving Him, walking in His ways, obeying, carrying out His Word. Everything that you do when you're doing the Word is essentially seeking Him in some aspect of following His way and there'll be life to those that find them, those that find the Word of God, and it will produce health to all their flesh. This Word that comes into you, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20, 
is to lead you in the right path, but it's also going to correct you when you're in the wrong path. Verse 20, my son, keep my father's commandment, forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine hand and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. The word will be leading you. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. The word will talk with you. God's word will be brought. The Holy Spirit will quicken the word. And scriptures will come up before you. For the commandment is a lamp. It's a light. And the law is light. And the reproofs or the corrections here, are the reproofs of instruction, the correction of his discipline and chastening of you are the way of life. You've got to be correctable. I find so many Christians today aren't correctable. You give them the word and you show them something that corrects something that they've been doing and they just continue to do it. It's astounding that they don't hearken unto the things that they should be doing. If you have seen that the scripture says you're not supposed to be doing something and you continue to do it, uh, you haven't received the correction. That's sin, isn't it? God wants us to receive the reproofs of his correction, discipline, chastening, correction, this means. They're the way of life so you don't continue down a path that is not of the Lord. Be correctable. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35. For whoso findeth me, findeth life. Again, you find him when you get in the Word. Jesus reveals himself through the Word that you study. You'll find life, and also you'll obtain favor of the Lord. You want God's favor, you want his grace, you want his blessing that comes from him. That's what you want. And you're going to find him, you're going to find life, and it will come forth. As the word comes into you, the word is to come out of you. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11. The mouth is a righteous, of a righteous man is a well of life. The word gets written in two places. It gets written in your heart and it gets written in your mind. In your mind, it's bringing knowledge to you so you can choose the right way of the Lord. In your heart, now you have the power of God resident within you. And in your heart brings the motivations of the things that God wants. And then out of the, the mouth of the righteous man, it's like a well of life. It's going to be coming out of the word that's in your heart. That's where the power is released. That's, of course, why the devil attacks the word, because he wants to take it out of your heart so you don't see any fruit come forth from it. Your mouth is a releaser of what is in you in your heart. You must get the word in you and learn to speak the word. The mouth of the righteous. The righteous guy is the guy who's speaking the word. He's doing righteousness. He's walking in righteousness. He's thinking according to righteousness. And he's speaking it. Certainly the mouth of the unrighteous, who's got all this evil in him, wouldn't produce that. The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. It will bring life out of you. You are to speak it forth, to minister to others, as well as speak forth the things of God to bring forth his life and his blessings, his healing, his deliverance for you and your life. Verse 16, the labor of the righteous tends to life. He wants you to be a servant. He wants you to be working for him. You have a ministry, and you're to be carrying out the ministry of the Lord, serving him, ministering to others, preaching the gospel, ministering healing, ministering deliverance, counseling, encouraging, exhorting people in the way of the Lord. You may be a labor of righteousness, then it's going to tend to life. This means you're to be a servant of the Lord, serving Him. And again, he says, He is in the way of life that keeps the instruction, the discipline, chasing, and correction. When God comes to correct you, you need to receive it and then keep it and hold on to it and continue to walk in it. But the guy who refuses he refuses the reproof, the correction, the rebuke. He errs. Don't be one, again, as we just mentioned. Don't be one of those that refuses the correction. It's a great mistake. You are erring before God, and you will shut down the things that God wants to accomplish in your life till you come to repentance. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 19. 
as righteousness tends to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. So what should we be pursuing? We, what should we be pursuing? We should be pursuing righteousness by hearing the word and doing the word of righteousness to bring forth fruits of righteousness in our life. That's what produces righteousness. And of course, that tends to life. In fact, we even see what does the fruit produce? It says so in Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous. This fruit that comes from you hearing and doing the word in all areas of your life. It's a tree of life. that produces life every which way in all aspects of your life, like a tree of life. He that wins souls also is wise. So God wants this fruit. You've got to have good fruit. Good fruit comes from the word of God that you're hearing and doing. God knows you by your fruit. And you want to see that you're going to be showing forth a tree of life coming out of you. It's because of the fruit of the righteous. Because you're hearing the word of righteousness. You're doing the word of righteousness. You're walking in the way of righteousness. And you see it constantly. The life of God is tied in with righteousness. Because only the righteous enter into a life eternal. Proverbs 12, 28. In the way of righteousness is life. Again, you've got to be walking right. In the pathway, in the pathway thereof, there is no death. No death whatsoever. Life, healing, blessing, all the good things that God wants. It all comes down to walking in line with the word of God in righteousness and not compromising it whatsoever. Proverbs 13, verse 3. He that keepeth his mouth, or watches over, this is the word natsar, which really would mean to watch over his mouth, He's keeping, and this is a different word, it's the word shamar, which means to guard. If you watch over your mouth, you will guard your life. Meaning, you can cause yourself a lot of problems with your mouth. Remember, death and life are in the power of the tongue. You can be speaking wrong things and sowing death and bringing death against you, as well as releasing it out of you. If you watch over your mouth and make sure you only speak right things, then you'll be guarding his life. But he that opens wide his lips shall have destruction, just lets anything come out of his mouth. Watch the words you speak. Bridle your tongue. You know, if we don't bridle our tongue, our religion's in vain, the Bible says. And remember, it's sowing evil things in your heart if you speak the wrong things. So make sure you're not opening wide your lips and just kind of going on and saying all these negative things. You're going to have destruction. You watch over your mouth. You will keep the life and guard the life of God within you. Verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope is the confident expectancy of what God will bring forth for us. If it hasn't come, then we haven't seen the realization of that promise yet. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It brings our, the hopes into being. But when the desire comes, when what hope is, the strong, the confident expectancy, the desire to see that promise come to pass, when it comes, it's a tree of life. God wants you to possess the promises of God. And so as you possess them, the desire coming, then it will be a tree of life for you. Verse 14, the law of the wise is a fountain of life. Here's this fountain again to depart from the snares of death. That tells you the devil, again, remember, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy if he can. And he wants to take you down the path of the snares of death. Well, you'll depart from the snares of death if you are wise. The law of the wise, it's a fountain of life. And where do you get wisdom from? The word. And how did you get wisdom? Because you've been hearing and doing it. Remember, you get knowledge. You act upon it, you get understanding imparted, you continue in it, and you get wisdom. When you have wisdom, you'll know what to do, and you'll walk in those ways of, of the Word of God consistently. The law of the wise is a fountain of life. And it's a fountain. This means it is springing up continually, coming out of you. That's what you want. You don't want anything evil coming out of you whatsoever. There shouldn't be a mixture coming out of you. One minute it's good, and the next minute it's evil stuff. Well, there's a problem. You shouldn't be speaking one good things one minute and the next minute something else. Or one minute you're thinking on the things that are righteous, next minute your thoughts are over here of all this ungodly things. No, that's, those things should not be happening whatsoever. That's because you've got to get the word in you and put it in operation so you come to the place of wisdom, having wisdom in everything. 
one of the reasons why people are one way, one minute, one way, another minute, because they really haven't put the word first place and been a hearer and a doer to get to the place of having wisdom. You must get the wisdom of God through the word in your life. Proverbs 14, 27. The fear of the Lord is also a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil in Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from uh, evil and depart from iniquity. They turn away from it. The fear of the Lord, you have the fear of the Lord, you're supposed to live in it all day long. You will not want to walk in anything contrary to the word. We're to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the conclusion of the whole matter he talks about. The fear of the Lord will also keep you away from walking in sin, of course, which will pollute you. And because that implies you'll be walking in line with the Word, because you're not going to walk in the way of evil, then your fountain of life is going to come out of you. Another thing that we see in verse 30, a sound heart, a healed whole heart, is the life of the flesh. What's going on in your heart is so important. You've got to make sure that your heart is right. You can't have all this evil stuff in your heart and think you're going to have life coming out of you. You can't have a hard heart. You can't have evil in your heart or doubt in your heart. You can't have unforgiveness in your heart or a bitterness in your heart or, you know, anger, all, all these negative kind of things, jealousy in your heart, whatever it might be. No. A sound heart is the life of the flesh. He wants a healed heart. God wants you healed. Maybe you've been wounded, hurt, rejected, abused, trauma, on and on, all kinds of destructive things. You need to get healed and get delivered. You've got to deal with all the sin areas. You need to cast out all the demons. And you need to get the word in you and keep the word in you and not let anything come evil in you. You've got to govern yourself in your thought life and what you're yielding yourself to so you don't let the devil come in and keep on working at you. Because whatever you're thinking upon, it's going to be affecting you in your heart. You need a sound, healed, whole heart. That's very important. In fact, God wants us to come to the place of having a perfect heart. And that is where we're all headed. Well, that means you've got to get a healed heart before you're going to get to the place of having a perfect heart. That's for sure. So any areas of sin, anything that's gotten into your heart that's not of God, you've got to deal with it. You've got to get rid of it out of your life. And God will do that as you hear and do his word, go through his deliverance, get healed. Proverbs 15, verse 4. A wholesome tongue, a healthy, healing tongue, is a tree of life. Again, your tongue. Got to make sure you're speaking the right things. You shouldn't be speaking perverse things. You shouldn't be, shouldn't be speaking death. You shouldn't be speaking negativism. You shouldn't be speaking poor old me, you know. Speaking every time of something negative happens and then you're, you're down on the mouth and so forth. No. Perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Notice, if you're speaking perverse things, anything that's contrary to the word, you're actually making a break. A breach means a break in the spirit. You're not going to have the life of God manifest in it, if anything. Instead, there's a break in the spirit. You're going to be opening the door for the enemy to come in. Watch the words that you speak. Of course, we're living according to the word of God. Proverbs 15, 24. The way of life is above to the wise. Above? That's right. You're living according to what's above. Remember, you're born from above. You're a citizen of heaven. You're now to live according to heaven's ways, the way of the spirit, which is the way of the word of God. That's why you're separate from the world can't walk after the flesh, you can't be walking after the things of this, of the way ma man operates, no. And notice what it's, how important it is. The way of life is above to the wise, that's the one who's put in the word first place, hearing and doing it consistently, that he may depart from hell. This is the word hell, Sheol, beneath. Meaning if you're not following the way of life, you might end up in hell. It tells you about you're going to depart from hell beneath because you're walking after the way of life, which means the way of righteousness. He expects us to walk in the way of the word of God. 
We see another scripture tied into this with the correction area. Proverbs 15. In verse 31. The ear that heareth the reproof of life abides among the wise. Again, people that won't listen to correction. People, I'm going to do it my way, you know. I'm, I'm, I like what I do instead of receiving the correction and getting in line with the Word of God. If he hears it, he's going to, ha conquer, he's going to conquer that area and he's going to yield to what God wants. He abides among the wise because he's going to advance in the things of God. He's going to overcome a problem in his life. That's what God wants. But he that refuses instruction or discipline chastening, he actually despises his own soul. You actually hate your own soul, whether you realize it or not, because you're not receiving that which is going to be profitable to your soul, the correction. He that heareth reproof gets understanding, because you're going to get the understanding. You're going to come to the place of realizing you know, that was the wrong way to be walking in. Proverbs 16, verse 15. In the light of the king's countenance, or his presence, is life. The more you're in the presence of God, the more you're going to see the life of God manifested. Therefore, you want to minister to him. You want to be in the presence of God, praising, worshiping him, praying, seeking him, in the word. All these things are going to bring you into the presence of God in some aspect. That produces life. And then his favor will be as the cloud of the latter rain. You'll see the favor of God because you come in the presence of God. That's why you need to be a praiser and a worshiper of God. You minister to him, he will minister back unto you. Verse 22. Understanding is a wellspring, same word for fountain, of life unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. Do you want to hear the instruction of fools? Anything that comes from them, it's folly? No, not at all. You listen to anything out there in the secular world, from the TV, from the movies, from any of those things, you're hearing foolishness and folly. <laughs> you don't want to have anything to do with that. You want to get understanding of spiritual things. You don't want to understand all these other things. Understanding is a wellspring of life to him that has it. You've got to get the knowledge, the understanding, and the wisdom. We've seen this come forth many times in different ways. Again, the scripture we quoted earlier, but we'll, you'll look at it here at this point. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whatever you speak is what you're going to get. Make sure you're speaking right things. Notice it said a man's belly will be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. And with the increase of his lips, he'll be filled. What's been coming out of your mouth? Have you been speaking the word of God? Have you been speaking things that minister life? Have you been speaking things that are, that are in line with the truth? Or have you been speaking all these other things? And well, we shouldn't be doing it. You could be releasing death or you can be releasing life. Your mouth is so important. Proverbs 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord tends to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. We saw it before about the fear of the Lord, but here it even talks more about what the fear of the Lord will do. He'll abide satisfied. Abide satisfy. He shall not be visited with evil. That means you, can walk, you won't have any evil coming to you if you walk in the fear of the Lord. Because the fear of the Lord will cause you to hate evil. You will depart from anything that's of iniquity. You will not walk in anything that is contrary to the word. You don't want to see anything. You don't want to hear anything that's not in line with the word. You don't want to be around anything that's not of God. If you are taken in through your members anything that's not of God, you are polluted. <laughs> You're polluted. And it's not going to bring forth the, the, the life of God. No. And you're not going to abide satisfied either. You're going to have all kind of turmoil from doing the wrong things. And you think you're going to not be visited with evil? No, that's how evil comes in, through listening to all these evil things. Close the door to your members to anything that is not of the Lord. That is so important. It's amazing. 
You're born from above. Why do you waste your time in worldly pursuits or anything that's of this world outside of what you need to know? Proverbs 21, verse 21. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness, and honor. You're a doer of the word of righteousness. You're showing mercy to others. Remember, we're going to be merciful. If you are merciful, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy from the Lord. You're going to get that. You're going to find his life. You're going to find righteousness because you're going to be righteous because you're following righteousness. And you're going to be honored by the Lord. God will honor you because you are doing. And following means to pursue after it. This is the word right off, where it means pursue, translated pursue many times. You're pursuing, you're running after it. This is where you should be running after righteousness and, and showing forth mercy. Now, if you're running after that, you won't be judgmental, you won't be critical, you won't be down on people and speaking all this negative stuff all the time. <laughs> That's not what God wants. Whatever you give out, it's going to come back to you, remember. You, whatever you sow, you're going to be reaping. So make sure you're only speaking the right things, following after mercy, following after righteousness. All these things are so important. Proverbs 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord, here we see it again, are riches and honor and life. You want to see the riches of God come to you, and it's in all aspects. The honor of God, the life of God. You've got to have humility, and you've got to have the fear of the Lord. You can't be compromising the word and think you're going to see it. You can't be doing things your own way and think you're going to see it. You've got to do things his way. Until you come to the place of putting the word of God first place and doing exactly what he tells you to do, you're going to be hindering seeing God accomplish what he purposes. He wants to bring riches and honor and life and blessing upon us. He wants the blessings to come on us and overtake us in our life. This brings us to New Testament scriptures. Matthew chapter 7 really brings it down home on how we're going to get to have life. It's starting to really tell us what we need to know. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. This tells us something. There's a narrow way that leads to life, and there's a broad way, which is about any, any other way, leads to destruction. It's only a narrow way, and that narrow way is the way of the word. When it says enter in, at the straight gate. This means, the word straight means actually narrow. If you notice below, stenos. You're to enter in at the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that is leading to destruction. Many people, are there, what, anybody does all these other things they want to do, it's leading them to destruction. Notice, the many are going there. Make sure that you're not violating the Word of God or doing things contrary to the Word of God to accomplish things. So many people, they try to, they do things the world's way to accomplish things, and it's a mistake. They're going the wrong way. Because straight, stenos again, narrow is the way, is the gate. And then it says narrow. This is the word flibo, where we get our word flipsis, meaning pressure. And here it means to be pressed pressed or pressured, a pressured way, is the way. You'll be pressed. Who's going to press you? The enemy will press you every step of the way. You're going to go through the pressure that will come against you. We'll come back to this in a moment. But we've seen this before. But it certainly is important to understand. Acts 14.22, concerning this confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, necessary, through much tribulation, flipsis, pressure, enter into the kingdom of God. There'll be much pressure. Much pressure is going to come against you. But you're going to go through it, remember. You go through it, not getting overwhelmed by it, not getting beat down by it. You go through it. The tax will be there. The enemy will press you. The flesh will press you. The world, every other kind of thing will press you. 
Even well-meaning Christians will press you to try to get you to do things, and if they get you off the word, you run from that. I don't care who they are. It doesn't matter what they are trying to tell you to do. You better be sure you're walking the straight, narrow path. We go back to Matthew 7 again, verse 14. Narrow, the, uh, narrow is the gate, pressed is the way, which is leading, because this is going to be an ongoing path you're going to be taking, continually leading you unto life, because you're going to be walking this walk continually to get there, see? And few there be that find it. That means there's not very many people that are being led continually in this path, the narrow path that leads to life. I mean, they're going all kinds of which ways. You can't do whatever you want. You must live unto Him and do things God's way. Accomplish things God's way. If you do it other ways, God's not in it. It's fruitless and it's a mistake. We need to do things in the way of the Lord. Example, just even we've talked about in the past without looking at Asa. Asa was the one who trusted in the Lord for getting victory against the Lubims and the Ethiopians that came against him, a million of them, and he, the Lord smote them all and they got defeated. But then when later, when it came, when Israel, the northern tribes, came against him, he didn't trust in the Lord. He looked to Syria, the king of Syria, to help him. And he got rid of them. He had a league with them and, you know, solved the problem. <laughs> but it didn't solve the problem because the seer showed up and said, you didn't trust in the Lord. Up to that time, he didn't have wars. He said, from henceforth, you're going to have wars. Of course, he got mad at the seer, remember, and threw him in the prison. <laughs> but it ended up, he cost him because he got a disease in his feet and two, after two years died. What a mistake. All because of the fact that he wouldn't do things God's way. It led him down that path. You'd start doing things contrary to God's way, it'll lead you down you a wrong path. And that's what happened to him. We've got to make sure we're following the way of the few. It is the way of the word. This brings us to another point. You must destroy a soul realm directed life. You're to walk after the spirit. We'll back up for a moment. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will, this is the main verb here, is willing, present tense, wills continually, to come, this is an infinitive, so it would be translated to come. If any man is willing, he's setting his will to come after me, which is what you should be, what you do first off, you deny yourself. If you don't deny yourself, are you going to walk in the way of the Lord? No. You're going to do what you want. And take up his cross. In Luke 9, 23, it says, take up your cross daily, which is what? Where something's put to death. What's put to death daily? The deeds of the body. You cannot let the flesh dictate and run you. If you're yielding to the flesh, you're sinning left and right because sin is dwelling in the flesh. And follow me. This is one who's following him joining him like a disciple, doing his word. Then he comes here and he says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What's that talking about? I want God's life to be operating in me. Well, the word for life is the word zoe, which we've been, we'll see, but this particular word is the word suke. It's a different word. Suke is the word which really means soul. Translated soul, the majority of times, and that's what it's referring to here. Whoever will save his soul, referring to his soul life, soul-directed life, he's going to destroy it, Apollomy. Are you to live by your soul, which is your will, intellect, and emotions? What I feel, what I think, my take on it, what I want to do? No. You're to submit to the Lord, aren't you? You're to choose what He wants. You're to think on what He wants. And you're not to let your feelings, which almost all of them come from the flesh, direct you because it'll deceive you for sure. 
you'll destroy it. Whosoever will destroy Apollome, is the word, his suke, soul realm life, that being what's directing you, for my sake shall find it. Otherwise, you're going to really have a soul realm life that'll be real true life because it's going to come from God, from his word coming into you. In other words, if you don't walk after the word, after the way of the spirit, and you just walk after whatever I feel, what I think, my desire, what I want to do, if you're an I, 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 me, 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 I feel person, you're in trouble. You're going to destroy yourself. You cannot do that. We see a major problem among Christians today. Just listen to what they say. Well, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. I don't feel like this, and I don't feel like that. Well, I feel like I should do this, and I feel, 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 feel. Listen to yourself. I feel, I feel, I feel, feel. Do you say I feel, feel, feel all the time? Where's that coming from? Was that in line with the word, or was that what I feel? Especially, and we're not picking on anybody, but women, you are emotional and you are feelers. That's not bad as long as you govern it with the word. Men are reasoners and they got to watch their mind. They don't reason things and make lots of bad choices and mistakes as well. But you, that's, that's, that's also in the soul realm. You got to put the word first place. How do you overcome this, this problem of the soul directing us? What does the word say? Feeling? Is that in line with the word? No. Kick it out. Choose. I don't want to. God says to do this. Uh, Will, we're not listening to you, Will. We're choosing the way of the Lord. You put the word first place. That's what you need to do if you are going to see God bring victory. Now we come to another one. Matthew chapter 18, verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, or it causes you to stumble, that'd be to sin, cut them off. Cast them from thee. Better for thee to enter into life, Zoe life, the life of God, halt or maim rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. <laughs> well, that means you could be cast into fire if you're yielding your members to sin. Well, that would be a great mistake. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. Better for thee to enter into Zoe life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. <laughs> that tells you something. We've got to yield our members. Over in Mark's account, your members are important if you're going to have the life of God. If your hand offends me, cut it off, it says. Better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, the worm that dieth not, the fire is not quenched. If your foot offend you, same thing. If your eye offends you, same thing. All your members. God wants you to yield your members unto him. Remember what it says over in Romans in chapter 6, verse 16. Know ye not to... Oh, I'm sorry, it's back in verse 13. Wrong one. Neither yield you your members, that would be all your faculties, what you see, what you hear, what you think, what you put your hands to, steps you're walking in, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God. That's what you're to yield yourself to, all your members unto God. And lie from the dead in your members as instruments of righteousness. That means I only want to hear righteousness. I only want to speak righteousness. I only want to see what's going to be in line with righteousness. That cuts about everything out in the, in the, in the secular world. <laughs> TV, movies, all the garbage out there, it pollutes you. I only want to put my hands to things that are right. You know, all your members, whatever you're, you're speaking as well. And this is a command when he says this. He's not just um, giving you a, a, nice, a little nice thought wherever the verb is, there it is. This is a command, present tense as well. He's saying, do not ever 
be yielding your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't do it. It's going to pollute you. Now, God doesn't want us to cut off our hand, cut, cut off our ear, blind out, cut out our eye and those things. No, he wants us to guard ourselves and get away from all these things and make sure that we're only watching the right things, listening the right things. That is what he wants. We're going to meet the conditions to enter into eternal life. Matthew 19, verse 16. Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He understood that it was a conditional statement, as he understood that it was conditional, that I may be having continually eternal life. He obviously had heard enough of what Jesus had been speaking. He said, Why callest me thou good? There's none good but one that's God. If thou will enter, if you will, that's the main verb here again, if you are willing and you're setting your will to enter, this is an infinitive, to enter into Zoe life, the everlasting life, keep the commandments. That is the answer. We need to be keeping the commandments of God. Of course, you know, he said to him, which? <laughs> you know, he's trying to find out which ones do I have to keep? Well, we're to keep them all, aren't we? And what commandments do we keep? The New Testament commandments now, which is what we're under now. We're not under the Old Testament. It's been changed. The law has been changed. We're under the New Testament. Hebrews 7.12, we've talked about that. And he gives all these commandments. And the young man says, all these things I've kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Ah, there's another problem here still. And notice what else he said as you're keeping these commandments. He said unto him, if thou will, willing, which he was willing to what? To enter into eternal life, to have, be having eternal life. If you're willing continually, and he doesn't say now to enter into life again. No, he says to be perfect. To go on into perfection. To be is the verb, which is infinitive, to continually to be. If you are willing to continually be perfect, well, I thought we were talking about entering into eternal life. We are. The perfect are the ones that enter into eternal life. The ones that keep his commandments. So he tells them what really is all about keeping the commandments. It's coming to perfection. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Be following me. Why did he need to do this? Because he had great possessions and it was all an idol in his life. There's nothing wrong with having possessions as long as it's not an idol. Don't let anything be an idol in your life. Don't let money be an idol. Don't let a job be an idol. Don't let a person be an idol. Don't let anything be an idol. In this case, he had all these possessions. And of course, we're supposed to come and follow him. That is what he wants. The young man heard the sayings. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He didn't want to turn loose of his idol. It wasn't saying that we have to get rid of everything. No, God wants to prosper us. But if you have an idol of things, get rid of it. Until you get rid of the idolatry is what you really need to do so you don't give place to things. Another thing that we see, if you're going to have eternal life, we're seeing all these conditions. 29 it is. Matthew 19, 29. Everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Now this doesn't mean that we throw our wife out the window and our children and father and mother and everybody out there. No. Because this is talking about the fact that you can't have any of these things before the Lord. You must forsake anything that might hinder you from following the Lord. Which is what he expects of us. There's another scripture, it's over in the other account, where he talks about the guy who's worthy. The only guy that's worthy of him is the guy who denies himself and he, he, you know, he walks in the ways of the Lord. He, he's not, he doesn't follow after what someone else wants. You've know, you got to forsake father and mother. If you don't, you're not worthy of me. 
You know, you can't be my disciple, he talked about. It's in Luke's account. So here, you need to forsake all, essentially. If you're forsaking all, the, forsake all, that would say, essentially. Forsake everything. Put away anything that would hinder you from following the Lord. There can't be anything. You put him first place. You do everything that he says. He wants you to walk in the ways of the Lord and become the person who is righteous before him. We'll look at one last scripture before we stop for this morning. In Matthew chapter 25, we come down to verse 46. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Who are going to be the ones that are going to enter into life eternal? The righteous. That's what God wants. He wants you to be righteous. The righteous are the only ones that are going to make it. Remember, the righteous are the ones that are in the new heavens and the new earth. This is conditions that we're talking about for everlasting life. It's absolutely essential. And we will look at the scripture one last time that we looked at to begin with because it's such an important scripture. You and I want to partake of the tree of life and live forever with the Lord. Blessed are those who are doing His commandments. There's the one that has the authority and the right to the tree of life that they might enter into the gates of the city. That's what we want. We're going to meet the conditions of it. You can already see the conditions of it. Really putting his word first place, getting his knowledge, his wisdom, or his understanding, his wisdom, walking in the ways of the Lord. So the words, what's coming out of you, like a fountain of life and everything, you're speaking right, you're thinking right, you're yielding your members to the things of God, you're walking uprightly before him, you're putting his word first place, you have fruit in your life. Your, everything was all tied in. We saw so many times of righteousness tied into it, which is what we see here. It's the guys who are doing his commandments is the one who is righteous, keeping the commandments of the Lord, being correctable, making sure you're walking the straight and narrow path, which only the few are doing. That means we've got to be one of the few. Make sure you're one of the few, you're walking the straight and narrow path, and you're going to meet the conditions. You're going to choose that as we've seen. You're going to seek after it to find it. You're going to be in the Word. If you don't know the Word, how are you going to be able to walk in the paths that lead to life? <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. You need to know the Word. And again, remember, you're going to destroy that soul realm directed life. And you're going to yield your members unto Him. Do not let anything come into you that's polluting you. We, you know, we don't want to have any opportunity for anything to take us down it says, remember, we want to depart from the snares and the way of depart from the way that goes down to hell. We're going to walk in the way that's going to lead us in the way of above that's going to lead us to everlasting life. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of eternal life and that there are conditions to entering into eternal life. It begins with being born again and then continues on as I put the Word of God first place and I eat the bread of God which is the Word of God that feeds me that brings knowledge that brings revelation of the ways of the Lord as I'm a hearer and a doer of the Word of God the life of God will come to me abundantly I choose the life of God. I choose the path of the Lord. I will get knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I will seek after it. I will receive correction. I will walk in the way of righteousness to bring forth fruits of righteousness. I will yield my members to things that are in line with the word. My mouth I will watch over it so I only speak right words. It'll be a tree of life that'll be coming out of me as I'm speaking right things, thinking right things, doing the Word of God. I will have the fear of the Lord. I will have humility. And I understand 
Narrow is the way and pressed is that way that leads to life. I will deny myself. I will crucify the flesh daily. I will destroy the soul realm directed life. I will not follow my feelings or what I want or my thoughts without submitting them to the word. I will choose the way of the Lord and keep the commandments of Jesus Christ to become perfect, to go on to perfection, to enter into eternal life. I thank you that as I do your commandments, I will have the right to the tree of life and I will enter in to the city in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Eternal life. That's the big picture, isn't it? Living forever with God in a place of he the new heavens and the new earth and being in a place where no death, no nothing, everything in perfect for all of eternity. It's worth it all. Get rid of everything that's not of God. Yield your members only to Him. Put Him first place in your life. It is so important. And don't believe the lie thinking that, well, I'm, I'm born again. I have eternal life. It's already done. We destroyed that with all these different scriptures today. It's not a so. You're going to walk that walk that's going to lead continually to eternal life, the narrow path. Father, thank you for all you brought forth. We will be doers of your word. We thank you and praise you for bringing forth eternal life in every single one of us through the life of God manifest in us the tree of life that's coming forth as we hear and do this word. Thank you, Father, for establishing us and meeting the conditions necessary for having eternal life all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen.